Good afternoon. I'm David Plazas, the opinion and engagement editor for The Tennessean. On behalf of the Tennessean Editorial Board, we have the pleasure of having John Ray Clemens, candidate for mayor of Nashville Davidson County, here with us. We also have Maria DeVereen, our executive editor of The Tennessean. This past week, we've been doing the public service of having mayoral candidates and also at-large Metro Council candidates with us to ask them questions about their candidacy and also the issues that are most important to them and to the voters. Thank you very much, Representative Clements. We appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So, well, so why are you running? Well, because I've been working on these issues facing Nashville for the last five years in the state legislature. Before that, I was working on them as a neighborhood association president, as a private practice attorney. You know, I've worked in nonprofits here in the local community, so I'm well aware of what's going on. I'm well aware of the biggest challenges facing Nashville. And, you know, we have some serious challenges, and I've become increasingly frustrated. You know, I decided to run for the State House of Representatives when I saw our state getting off track and didn't feel like the leadership was there necessary to really fight back against the bad things and provide leadership where necessary on others. And now, you know, looking at Metro, I see this lack of leadership, a lack of vision, a lack of willingness to make the tough decisions to move our city forward on the biggest challenges, you know, like those I've been working on, affordable housing, public education, infrastructure, you know, those just to name a few. But I feel very passionately about getting in and doing the work necessary to start moving the ball on these issues. Tell us a little bit about your background and qualifications and what makes you stand out from the other competitors. Well, I've had the opportunity to work in every level of government. I've worked in the U.S. Congress with Bob Clement. You know, I've worked on boards and commissions at the state and local level. I've served in the state legislature. I've been a neighborhood association president. I've, like I said, I've served in the nonprofit community. I have this perspective. I have the connections at every level of government and an ability and willingness to collaborate with others to solve the problems. And, you know, like I said, I've got experience, a long, a long history of experience working on these specific issues that are the biggest challenges facing Nashville. And as you know, I mean, you know, most people will tell you I'm not afraid to stand up and do what I think is right. It may not always be the easiest thing. It may not, we may not always win, but I believe that standing up and fighting for what is right is important. And, you know, some people give me a hard time about that, but I think our values are worth fighting for. I think public education, you know, infrastructure, these things that we really need to be working on, I think they're worth fighting for. Yeah, thank you. Now you have said that Nashville, while Nashville's headed in the right direction, the government is not. How do you align those two? Uh, say that again? You, you said that while Nashville may be headed in the right direction, prosperity-wise, but the government is not. How do you align those two interests? Right. Well, I mean, I think in Nashville, we're seeing this unprecedented prosperity, but unfortunately, too many are being left behind. And that's really a problem. We're not seeing this equitable distri distribution of money across our community. We're not seeing an equitable distribution of funds across the school district. We're not seeing the money that is being made in this town benefit the entire community. Uh, for too long, we have left entire communities behind. Bordeaux, Antioch, uh, White's Creek. You, you've seen these, these parts of our community that have failed to receive any significant investment. And so while the city is doing great and downtown and everybody uh, seemed, you know, there's this little percentage of the city that's doing really well. But as you travel around the city and you go out into the outer communities, people aren't doing so well. They're facing displacement. They're being pushed out of their homes. Their children are going to underfunded public schools. They're seeing flooding every time it rains. Uh, it, you know, these are serious challenges facing our city, and we need real leadership in the mayor's office who's going to start addressing these. We have kicked the can down the road on these big issues. Talk with us a little bit about how you would address some of the concerns with the school board. I know we have a new chief for the next two years in charge of the district, but tell us a little bit about what your plans would be for the schools. Well, schools are my top priority. My children attend public school. I've got three small boys, nine, seven, well, the, my youngest just turned five yesterday, and he will enter kindergarten this year. So all three of them will be at the same school for one year to be the greatest year of my life. <laughs> because I take my children to school every day and so that's the first thing I do before I go to the state capitol or before I go to my law firm or campaign I take my children to school and so working to improve our public schools is about building partnerships I think for too long we have seen the mayor's office and metro government point fingers at MNPS and say if the schools aren't performing or if there are failing schools it's all your fault well what we need to do first is build a strong partnership 
the mayor should be working in tandem, executing a shared vision, shared goals with the director of schools and the school board. One of the ways I want to do that is to, I want to bring people from the public and private sector in and appoint liaisons to each of the school board committees. For instance, you know, our school board's popularly elected, which is great, and I think it should remain so. Uh, you know, but not maybe none, nobody elected to the board has ever balanced a billion dollar budget. So why not bring someone from the private sector who has, not to overstep the charter, but just to be there, to be, be a resource and provide advice when called upon by the members. Uh, early childhood literacy is another example. Why not take somebody from Peabody College who's worked in this field, who's studied early childhood literacy, has worked with the data, put them on there just as a resource because you know school board members are, are elected just like the mayor just like a state representative and when I make tough decisions or when I face an issue that I don't know much about education I go speak to teachers if I'm working on health care I go speak to doctors and patients who've gone through these things so I think it would be a great resource for our school board in addition to that you know we we need to increase funding to our school system with our sister cities we rank about 18th out of 20 of our sister cities in per pupil funding. Now, depending on which numbers you look at, we fund our schools at a per pupil ratio of anywhere from $9,300 to $10,200, uh, depending on with whom you speak. Either way, that's, that's, too, that, that's not enough money. I think we need to strive to get more t closer to about $15,000 per student. Uh, only by doing this are we going to sufficiently be able to fund the school system, make sure that we're getting counselors, the social workers, uh, the social emotional learning instructors into the schools that are so badly needed. I, I just sent in the other morning speaking uh, with a group of children and, and they said the biggest challenge facing them is not having someone with whom they can speak outside their circle of friends. They're coming in uh, from communities of extreme poverty. They're coming in, maybe, maybe they're a member of the LGBTQ community, and maybe they can't speak to their parents. They need someone with whom they can speak. And I think our schools have an opportunity to provide those resources. In addition to that, I think the mayor's office and metro government needs to start taking ownership of the other 17 hours a day, as I call it. Our children are in school seven hours a day. The other 17 hours a day, they're in the community. Any adverse childhood experience that they experience in the community, whether it's hunger, housing instability, poverty, lack of access to transportation, all those things have a direct impact on that student. They take that into the classroom. And our teachers are faced with having too few resources, little assistance to you know, address a lot of these challenges above and beyond just teaching them math and English or, or science. And, and so we need to do a better job as a metro government of taking ownership of what is happening in the community, improving the quality of life of those children, and that will in turn have a direct impact on improving student performance in the classroom. And then, you know, we can talk about after school programs and, and better facilitating children into positive, safe environments from between three and seven o'clock after school. We have amazing nonprofits, faith-based community across the city that are there and they have programs too often our children just can't get to them or, they, or the parents don't know about them or, the, or they don't know about them. So we need to increase facilitation of that transition from school into these programs. And I think if we do those things, um, you know, above and beyond just spending money, it will make a significant difference in the lives of children and improve school performance. You've been in the legislature long enough to see the sometimes contentious relationship between uh, the state capital and the cities. Um, what are lessons that you've learned that you could apply if you're elected mayor that could help ameliorate that relationship? Well, it's all about collaboration. It's about knowing with whom you can work and with whom you know you can have a conversation about who how to move things forward. There is a wide recognition that Nashville is the economic engine of the state of Tennessee. All, every decision made in the state government it, it, you know, has a direct impact on us, which in turn has a direct impact on our local economy and then the economy of the entire state. But I will tell you one thing that I have figured out in the state legislature is that a lot of my colleagues in the supermajority, they prey on weakness. They will keep pushing and pushing until you stand up and push back. And so right now they see an easy target in Metro government. They see an easy target in the mayor's office. And so what we need to do as a city is never legislate out of fear. We should always do first and foremost what is in the best interest of Nashville residents. And then stand up when the state tries to come in, overstep their bounds. We need to have a strong legal department. 
that's not afraid to push back. We need to have lawyers in the legal department and a legal director who are, who are tried and tested in the courtrooms and that are not afraid to push back when appropriate. And right now that's not happening. And, you know, and again, it, aside from that, it goes back to just having those relationships, being able to work with somebody, look them in the eyes and have a tough conversation. You know, I disagree with the majority of my colleagues on, on, on some key issues in the state legislature, but that doesn't mean we don't get along. That doesn't mean we're not civil. Uh, it, it just means we disagree on that issue, but then we can have a conversation. You know, it's about finding those those common themes, you know, it may be just talking about our kids. It may be talking about our common interests, you know, where where they may exist. And, and, and at the end of the day, it's about working together. And if, if Nashville is prospering and our prosperity continues, it benefits the entire state. And I think that's widely recognized and it's becoming increasingly more so. Yeah. So voters did not pass the transit referendum in 2018, and that continues to be an issue facing Nashville. Can you tell us if you're elected do to help solve the transit and transportation issues? Yeah, well, traffic is the number one issue I hear about across the community, as you can imagine. Uh, now, I, we have some short-term things we can do and long-term things. I'm the only candidate in the race who is committed to having a transit referendum in my first term in office. I was instrumental in passing the IMPROVE Act and inserting that enabling legislation into the law that empowered metro government to be able to pass a transit referendum. That was, you know, the same bill that we pushed to uh, get 440 redone, which is one of my biggest successes in the state legislature. Um, we have that tool. We need to use it. Now, the question is, how do we do it well? And I think what we've learned from the past is we have designed plans that weren't always rooted or grounded in the most reliable data. Uh, we kind of designed a plan about how we wanted it to look. Then. Um, they went into the community and listened and tried to make what they heard in the community fit the plan that they wanted. I think you have to start by listening. We have, we've collected a lot of data. We need to build upon that data. We need to get down the community, really sit down and listen. Because parts of our community need different things, they want different things, and data supports different tools and resources for those communities. And so then we build a plan around what we hear in the community, what the data supports, and start to build a plan. Now, once we have this plan, simultaneously, we need to be working with the regional stakeholders. Surrounding counties, as we all know, are putting just as much pressure on Nashville roads as Nashville residents. So the surrounding counties are going to have to pay their fair share. That's a reality. And most of the surrounding county mayors, city mayors, they get it. Now we have a little bit more trouble, uh, you know, having that conversation with some of the state legislators that represent those areas. Uh, but they're starting to come around as well. But at the end of the day, the county mayors and the, and the local mayors will be the ones who control whether that transit referendum takes place. And they're going to have to step up and pay their fair share. And, but, but they all look to Nashville for leadership. They all look for us to set the pace and start working here from the urban core. And, and that's what we need to do. So we, we, we need to get out in the community, build the data, and, and collaborate and build a plan that works and makes sense that people can buy into. Now that's a long-term vision. That is, that's what's necessary to build out a 21st century forward-thinking transportation infrastructure plan. Now, in the short term, we've been talking about a lot of things for a long time. Synchronized time lights, uh, lane shifts coming in and out of downtown on major corridors, um, you know, various other things. Uh, On-demand buses are a popular topic of conversation these days. We can look at the benefits of those in certain corridors where ridership levels aren't as high. Uh, that would make a lot of sense in saving money, environmental benefits, and so forth. So I, think, I don't think anything should be off the table. I think we should have these conversations and work with short-term goals and a long-term vision. And I think that's how we'll move forward. But right now, you know, we, we've got a current administration that has promised not to do another referendum for another five or six years at least. We are busting at the seams. We cannot afford to wait any longer. This is a, a, a problem affecting people's quality of life today. Every minute we sit in traffic is one less minute helping our child with their homework, one less minute at work or doing something we love. This is an issue that must be addressed and it has to start now. This is just one of many examples of why change is so necessary in leadership of Metro government. Thank you. Now you distinguish yourself from the other leading mayoral candidates in that you were the only one to support the property tax rate increase proposal. Um, Tell us why and also what were some of the conversations you had about the pros and the cons about doing that? 
Well, the reality is it was, it was a snapshot in time. What decision was the best at that snapshot in time? It wasn't about what led us there and how could we have avoided it because there were a lot of things that we could have had some fiscal, uh, you know, we, we've had a lot of fiscal mismanagement and fiscal irresponsibility that led us to a point where the most fiscally responsible option was a property tax rate increase to pass a budget to fully fund the schools and address some of the needs of our first responders, which are real and pressing. And so while I think that a property tax rate increase should be our last resort moving forward, so before we get to the next budget, before we ever get to the point where we propose a property tax increase, we need to spend from the day I get elected until the day we introduce the budget working on finding those efficiencies in Metro government, redirecting current revenues where possible, creating new revenues or collecting revenues that we're currently letting kind of go by the wayside. Uh, I think linkage fees are an example of that. There's an argument that they're not legally allowed. I disagree. I, my reading of the state law and the public act is that we're allowed to charge linkage fees. Most of the other cities with whom we like to compare or with which we'd like to compare ourselves, they charge linkage fees to be commercial developers. For the burdens they're putting on the infrastructure systems, they can be paying their fair share. And so there are areas where we can look for money. And also, we, I, I think it's time we start, stop giving away the property tax base to large corporations. Uh, you know, we are, Nashville is a great city. We need to recognize that and start acting like one. I mean, we should be sitting down with these companies like this, negotiating from a position of strength. We continue to negotiate with companies looking to move to Nashville as if it's the 1980s or early 90s when we kind of had to beg companies to look at Nashville and entertain us as an option. Companies and families want to be in Nashville, Tennessee. Why aren't we having two-way negotiations? We should be demanding things from these companies just like they demand them from us. And I don't think it, I don't think it makes much sense to continue to give away the chief funding tool or source for our public schools when the quality of the public schools are the number one thing companies and families look at before they move to a city. At some point, we have to realize that that is a self-defeating model because our tax resources are precious and we need to protect them. Switching <clears throat> gears slightly, can you tell us what you would like to see at the fairgrounds and talk to us a little bit about that project? Well, I had the good pleasure, the, the honor of serving on the fair board once upon a time. Mayor Carl Dayton appointed me to the fair board, so I'm uniquely familiar with both the, the, the benefits and all the great things of, that the fairgrounds offers and all the activities there, but I'm also well aware of the challenges. And I think uh, we've seen some decisions made in the past few years since I left that um, that have changed the dynamics even more. And so, you know, I, the flea market is, is fantastic. People love it. The, you know, the Christmas show is, is a huge, that, if you've never been to the Christmas uh, show out there, it is enormous. People love it. And, you know, the racetrack is popular. It's required by the charter. And so the fairgrounds is, is worth protecting. It's worth protecting that part of our, our city's history, our character, I think, and it adds a lot to our character. I think some of the improvements being made out there are fantastic. They're great. Now, we, we'll see what impact a soccer stadium has on the property itself, but I would really love to see that state fair stay on that property. Uh, you know, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Nashville, but I was raised in Wilson County, and, and we have a pretty good fair. <laughs> One of my good friends has, has really worked hard on that fair for decades, and it is, it is a world-class fair. And, you know, I, I really, uh, we actually, my family used to run the goat show at the, at the Wilson County Fair. Little known fact, breaking here on, <laughs> on this interview, but uh, my father and I would run the South African boar goat show at the Wilson County Fair. But, so, th the fair is important. I would love to see it stay there. And, and I think we need to make sure that whatever is happening at the fairgrounds, we protect that character and all the great activities that take place there. One of the issues that you and other candidates addressed at the State of Black National Forum was the issue of access to opportunity and to contracts, so essentially the equity issue. Would you speak specifically in terms of what your plans would be to open up more opportunity to uh, contractors of color or contractors of other minority uh, uh, backgrounds? Yeah, it's really just doing what you say you're going to do. Right now, I think the last disparity study, uh, um, minority-owned businesses got 3.5%. 3.49% of Metro Prime contracts. That is unacceptable. Now, 
If you read, the NAACP just sent a letter saying that regardless of the announcement that was made in the past year by the current administration, they're actually seeing a worse climate than before. And so things that we can do are, are making and being purposeful about how we give out contracts in metro government, reevaluating the procurement process, making sure we're scoring the procurement process differently than we currently are, not only to incentivize um, minority-owned businesses and, and, and help them get contracts, but also to benefit companies that are taking care of their workers, that are paying livable wages, that are providing access to benefits. For too long, we've seen this reliance on temp, ag temp agencies uh, and kind of fly by night. We're seeing wage theft across the city. That can't be allowed to continue. Now, another way we can, in we can increase minority-owned businesses and their ability to get contracts is by having more minority-owned businesses. Right now, there's a lot of hurdles in place. Well, we should be using more Section 504 loans from the Small Business Administration. We have a CDC right here in town. It basically goes unused. I think the most used CDC in this uh, region is in uh, Mount Pleasant. But Section 504 loans are a great resource to get money into and starting small businesses, especially in the minority community. And if we would properly use those, we would see a lot more minority-owned businesses and we would see more ability to compete for those contracts. And, and, and I think that would move us forward and create a lot more equity. I think a good example of this is what you saw in Atlanta when, when, a, when one of the minority-owned businesses got a contract at the new Atlanta airport and the, the effect of that spread across the entire community. And it was a really remarkable impact that that had and set a precedent for how things could be done in the future. You mentioned earlier in our interview that transportation is the number one issue that voters and residents talk to you about. Can you tell us what number two and three are that you're hearing from people as you're out campaigning? Yeah, well, traffic is, is everybody's favorite topic, you know, but, but it's, it really is. It's public education and it's infrastructure, both above ground and below ground, uh, and affordable housing. And those are the top three. We've held over, we've been holding kitchen table talks all across the entire community. We've held over 40 of them in people's homes, in their small businesses, uh, in local community centers where people come. And we've had people, you know, six people at one, we've had 50 people at another. And we've just sat down and talked about the, the challenges facing them and their families and their locally owned small businesses. And the themes are consistent throughout. Those top three issues, the infrastructure, affordability, especially housing and public education. And, and then they, from one end of the county to the other, those are the, those are the top issues. Can you talk to us a little bit about your affordable housing plan and how you would tackle that issue? Right, so I've been working on this for several years. Uh, this isn't just something that came on my radar during this campaign. Uh, my first year in the State House of Representatives, I passed two bills on affordable housing. Uh, they were brought to me by a private developer who believes in m making affordable housing part of every one of his developments, and also with uh, Doug Sloan, who was at planning at the time. They came to me, said that these um, tweaks need to be made, and it would really help with affordable housing, and we were able to pass them my first year in office. And they're significant, and they're having a, a, a tremendous impact. And so, as mayor, uh, one of the things I think we need to do in working with, um, with affordable housing advocates, um, and there are many across the city that are doing amazing work. You've got Urban Housing Solutions, you have people like Kay Bowers, you have private developers who are doing these amazing things across the community. Everyone will tell you, we need at least $50 million a year in the Barnes Fund. And that money needs to be a created, dedicated revenue stream. Because as you know, the most expensive proposition of any development is the land cost. And developers, as they compete with others for the land and try to build affordable housing, they need that equity component to leverage with private investment to be able to build that affordable housing. So one of the things we talk about we want to do is work to increase the annual funding levels in the Barnes Fund for affordable housing up to $50 million a year. We would like to get that done over a five-year time period. But having that dedicated revenue stream on which people can rely that want to build affordable housing is crucial. Because right now, you know it goes up and down every year. It's contingent upon the political whims of the Metro Council and the mayor. We can't allow that to happen. We need consistency. Now, one of the other things I would like to do, we've continually seen um, public property be sold off uh, for, for one-time budgetary gap fill-ins. And so one of the ways I would like to see, if we're going to surplus public property, I want to create a land bank, which is a board that would take the land 
it would claim the title, and then it would determine in a public setting, in a transparent manner, it would determine the best use for that property before it hits or it, you know, lands in the hands of, of one of the biggest developers in town who's going to do what no, you know, who knows what with it. If they determine the best use with priority given to affordable housing, we will see more access to available property and be able to build more affordable housing. And you raised the fairgrounds issue. I took great issue with the 10 acre you know, uh, giveaway of, of that property. That, that was prime real estate where affordable housing could have been built uh, and, and should have been built on that property. At the end of the day, affordable housing should not be uh, limited to any one part of our town. No neighborhood should be off limits to anyone. And we should strive and work to build access to affordable housing and increase the net stock of affordable housing throughout the entire county. And that's not happening right now. Uh, there's a proposal on the table that's just not going to accomplish that. Uh, and it's going to give MDHA a blank check for a half a billion dollars, and it's not going to result in an increase of affordable housing stock substantially. We're looking at a 31,000 unit shortage in the next five and a half years. The last numbers said we're already facing a 19,000 unit shortage for families making $35,000 or less. This is an issue that stretches from the middle class all the way down to the lowest income households, and it is a crisis. And we must take a, just pro, be proactive about addressing this and acknowledge it's a crisis, invest in it accordingly, and lead on the issue. Some of the issues that especially the Metro Council candidates have brought up is trust and transparency in government. Where have you seen some of the holes in that, and what could you do to better the situation? With transparency in Metro government? Oh, in, in num numerous areas. I think MDHA is a good example. It's one of the least transparent. Uh, it's not accountable uh, to taxpayers in any way. It's, it's had a control of the TIF program. Uh, we've continued to see land that's surplused get sold off, like the, uh, the fire station in Green Hills, for instance, below market rate. Uh, these are types of things that really lower the confidence of Nashville residents in their government. This type of lack of transparency. I think this, the, you know, the mayor coming out of nowhere just this week and announcing he went and found $7.5 million from MDHA to provide teachers with the 4.5% raise is a good example. The MDHA board never voted on that. I spoke with some members. They didn't even know the deal was happening. And they, yet it was agreed upon in some back room that this was going to happen. I think the, the privatized public parking deal, that is a back room deal that was cut and now it's being relied upon to fill in a significant gap in the budget and it's still there despite the fact that it's still not been presented to the council. These types of deals don't, don't instill confidence in voters or residents of a city. These are things that we need to be having open conversations. There needs to be an open dialogue as we move forward as a city and, and going out and listening and having these conversations in the community. Right now, there's just this feeling that, um, you know, one of the common questions we get asked a lot across the community at these kitchen table talks and at forums is, where's all the money? And, and nobody understands why we're experiencing this unprecedented prosperity. And so we're having to, you know, me and the other candidates as well, we're having to explain to them how things have been layered and how things have been directed to send funding into specific areas and why it's not finding its way into our community. And, and, and people deserve to know that. People deserve to have an explanation and know what's going on. And I think that's, that's vital. The conversations, the communication between the mayor's office and, and, and the metro schools, the conversations between the mayor's office and the department heads. These things need to be in the public. I've pushed forward at the state level uh, to increase, to put, shine some sunshine and light on, on conversations. And I, I just, I think it's so vital to have, if we want the public to, you know, if we're going to increase public participation in the process, they have to have confidence in the process. And until we start, you know, leading that way at the very highest levels of government at any level, uh, we're going to continue to see this, this challenge. You touched on parking and the plan to privatize parking has been discussed as a way to either pay down debt or bring in revenue. Can you tell us your viewpoint on privatizing parking? I think it's a terrible idea. I, I, privatization, you always get the promises, you always get the bells and whistles, promises of more money, new efficiencies. It never bears fruit. fruit. That's why, as a state legislator, I led the fight against Governor Haslam's attempt to privatize the state parks. That's why I fought his attempt to outsource 
jobs at, co at state colleges and universities. It's why I, uh, one of many reasons I oppose privatized prisons. It, you, you get all these promises, but what you get in the end of the day, you get less money, you get almost no accountability to taxpayers, and there's very little transparency in how it's run. The, 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 the fine print on that privatized public parking deal is shocking, and, and it, it is in not in the best interest of this city. Now, what I've been told from my conversations with people in, public par in Metro Public Parking, we had a plan to update the technology of our parking meters. We had a plan to improve our public parking system. And right now, five individuals are responsible for enforcing parking in the entire city. This is the second lar largest geographic size city in the country. Five people are enforcing public parking in the city. It's understaffed, the parking tickets aren't being enforced, and of course the, the technology is old because we haven't invested to redo it. There is a unlimited capacity there for us if we invested in the technology ourselves, increased staffing. They said they need at least three more people to be able to do the job sufficiently in Metro Parking, three more staffers, and then if we enforce the tickets, if we really held people accountable for parking violations, which we don't do currently, we would continue to see increased revenue. We would maintain that, that government service and we would reap all the benefits of it. And we wouldn't be held or handcuffed by a private entity for the next 30 years. It, it, the numbers don't add up. And, and to get to the point where we're relying on privatizing public parking is just another example of years of fiscal mismanagement and irresponsibility. That is not the way you run a government. You talked earlier about uh, stormwater and flooding, and that's become a big issue over the years in terms of whether or not to build a flood wall along downtown. There's been some concerns about what about the neighborhoods like Antioch or, or others. Uh, what would be your approach to dealing with the issue of stormwater runoff and the potential for another massive flood as we're getting into the 10th anniversary of the 2010 flood? Yes, yeah, so this is what I was talking about with infrastructure above and below ground. Our water infrastructure system is archaic. We have to recognize that. I remember Mayor Bredesen talking about this once upon a time, and you've seen very little action. We, had a cons we were under a consent decree for several years uh, trying to address the issue. And so here we are, we, you know, in 2019, we still haven't done anything substantive about it. The reality is it's an expensive, it's an expensive problem, like most of these challenges are. That's why none of them are going to be solved overnight. But what is missing is the necessary plan and start taking action on it. That's, that's what's so vital to start addressing these issues. So my plan is, you know, our stormwater and our wastewater flows together under this town. It comes right down under this building, under Vanderbilt, the gulch out to the river. And our, we have so much capacity at water to treat um, the runoff and the wastewater. And, and with the increased rain levels, we're only seeing more. But what we're really seeing, the biggest problems are created by the uncontrolled growth in a lot of our neighborhoods. If you go to the Nations, which I represent right now, and we just had a forum there the other night, the Nations is just seeing unprecedented growth with a little accountability to the developers about what they're gonna do uh, with that stormwater runoff or how they're going to alleviate that. And so with increased growth, increased paving, increased um, and, uh, you know, um, ground coverage without taking care of our trees, without protecting our green space, we're going to continue to see problems. And that combined with the increased levels of rainfall, it's only going to get worse. And, and this is why, again, we, we cannot afford to wait any longer to start taking action on this. Um, I think, you know, you saw a sinkhole last week downtown. Uh, you're going to continue to see types of infrastructure um, collapses like that. I equate it, you know, I talk about these big buildings going up downtown. I equate them to taking a 2019 iMac and plugging it into an 1890s power outlet underground. At some point it's going to give. It just, we don't have the capacity for all the growth that we're experiencing. And so taking action is absolutely necessary. When it comes to a flood wall, you know, that, that's been proposed and I understand the value of flood wall to downtown businesses. But again, I represent West Nashville, I represent the nations. What impact is a flood wall diverting water from downtown gonna have on Bordeaux? What impact is it gonna have on the nations and these other communities? And so we need to have a full scale, I think, model to see 
what the impact will be. I don't know why it would be so difficult to do that. Just build a model, see how the water is going to react. If it shows that it's not going to detrimentally impact other parts of the community and, and, it, and it looks like a good idea, then I think downtown, the businesses that would benefit from it should pay for it. Uh, it's not something, you know, it's going to benefit them. It's going to mostly improve. Now, it's going to save the money a lot of city in the, in the long run, too. So I think everybody needs to have a little skin in the game. But before we ever get to the point where we talk, start talking about a flood wall, we need to know that other communities around our city are not going to be detrimentally impacted by it and that residential neighborhoods will be protected. This is a follow-up. Uh, a lot of these things have been, uh, the proposals have been financed by water revenue or general obligation bonds or other types of borrowing. Um, what concerns or what thoughts do you have in terms of the city's debt because we are continuing to uh, to increase that debt whether it's through the soccer stadium or through other other things right. this is continuing to become a burden on the city well the debt is real uh, there's no there's no avoiding the debt and right now we're spending you know i, I think we're going to continue to spend well in excess of 10 percent of our annual budget on the debt and with the the payments coming due i think we've got a couple more years where it's going to be at a peak before it starts to taper off and, but that may not even be true if we continue to take on more debt. And so again, that is a reality we're going to have to face as a city. Well, we're going to, we have to pay down the debt, and that's, you know, that's going to come off the, basically the top of the budget every year until we start making progress on this. But that, again, is why we need to be more responsible with how we sit, spend our money, how we collect money, and where money gets diverted. We, we've, we must be more responsible with the dollars. We're seeing this unprecedented growth and we have a credit rating that's based on the growth and the potential for additional revenue. We have to tap into that revenue. If we really want to continue to grow and really build a stronger foundation for continued prosperity and for continued growth, then we need to have that money to be able to reinvest in ourselves to strengthen our foundation. So we've talked quite a bit about growth. Can you tell us specifically, do you think Nashville is headed in the right direction? Do you want to see the growth continue or do you think it needs to slow down to curb some of that debt? Well, I think there's been a false narrative created. Uh, there's two, two ways to answer this question. The false narrative is we can either have continued prosperity or we can protect the character of our city and our neighborhoods. Well, that's a false choice because I, I think we can continue our prosperity and also protect the character of our neighborhoods by growing in a more thoughtful manner. We must be more mindful in how we grow and be more responsible in our planning and growth. Right now, I think we're seeing an abuse of the SP process. I think we're seeing uh, complete just growth for growth's sake without any thought about the impact that's putting on our infrastructure systems. I think we're, and, and, and also we're not getting the benefit of that growth, with, especially with regard to commercial development. Again, this takes me back to linkage fees. We see this increased density and we see all this growth, but, and that's putting additional burdens on the infrastructure, but there's no one paying their fair share for that additional burden. They're, they're making a lot of money by developing and building these big buildings or hundreds of houses, but what, what, what percentage are they investing in the future of the city? And, and again, we're not going to have continued prosperity if we don't start investing in a stronger foundation. If our water infrastructure system starts collapsing and giving way, if we continue to have massive traffic issues, which we're going to have if we don't do something, if we continue to allow our public school system to go underfunded, those are the things that are going to plateau our prosperity. Not growing and protecting the character of our cities, not being more mindful and thoughtful about how we grow. And so I think that's where an example of a real mindset shift is necessary in the highest levels of metro government. I, th I think just coming at it from that perspective would make a tremendous difference as we move forward if we really want to continue our prosperity. Thank you. At last night's Metro Council meeting, scooters were given a temporary reprieve. So at least for now, it looks like there's an opportunity that they'll be, they'll be here to I stay I knew you were going to come with scooters. So uh, you've talked about it. You're, 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 not, you're not a fan. I, th I think no ma major mayoral candidate is a fan of that. But be, given the fact that they might be here, and if you're elected mayor, what are you going to do to make sure that they're safe and that they're also useful? Well, you, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's about safety. It's about public safety. I've had too many conversations with Vanderbilt trauma surgeons who have just told me about the number of people coming into Vanderbilt with head trauma. So 
safety is the number one issue. You know, now, now do I enjoy them darting in and out of traffic and, you know, and, and riding on the sidewalks? Absolutely not. But at the end of the day, I'm more worried about the safety, not only for the users, but for pedestrians and others and, and cyclists. And, and the reality is scooters are never going to be a last mile option unless and until we invest in the necessary infrastructure to facilitate them and their use as such. You know, right now, the best use for a scooter, if you're wearing a helmet, is in a bike lane. Now, we see them everywhere else because we don't have bike lanes. We don't have bike lanes through downtown. We don't have bike lanes in major corridors um, because we haven't seen the leadership step up and make that a priority. And so if we want to, scooters to be a part of the city's future, I think we need to have good regulations. The regulations have to be enforced. And then we have to have the infrastructure to facilitate them for their intended use. Above and beyond just being toys for tourists, uh, which I took for heat, some heat for calling them at one forum. But currently, if you go downtown, I mean, it's hard to describe them as anything else because many residents can't use them as a last mile option. Some can, but we need to do a better job if we're really going to allow their continued growth. We have talked about a range of issues. Are there any other topics based on your priorities or your values that we haven't touched on that you want to share with us and our viewers today? Well, I think there's a couple of things. And I, I, I think talking about it from terms of the economic inequality in our city is, is it, recognizing that, that it is a real issue is important. And I think that's a subject that has been glanced over a lot in a lot of the conversations. We talked about a lot of the offshoots of that, you know, the big issues about lack of public transportation options, lack of access to uh, high quality, you know, educational opportunities, those types of things. But as you get outside of, you know, the in center of town and you start to see real poverty, you start to see real housing instability, you start to see a lot of things that really wake you up that wake me up at night and that our city's not talking about and it's not doing anything to improve the quality of life of every resident. That is a real issue. And until we acknowledge the fact that there is real poverty in this city and that some people in this city are not benefiting from the boom, we're gonna continue to be held back. But we have to start operating and running this city with values in mind. And we talk about ours in terms of equity, opportunity, and justice, making every decision, thinking about ensuring equity, creating opportunity, and demanding justice. Now that sounds like a cliche, and it sounds like some fancy campaign slogan, but the reality is, if you stop and think about all your decisions that you make, whether they're funding, whether they're, you know, any other uh, decision you make through those lenses, until we start to do that, I think we will continue to see the status quo continue and we will continue to see entire communities across the city be left behind. And, you know, you're seeing it playing out a lot in youth violence. You know, you, we haven't talked about youth violence, but youth violence is, is an offshoot of real poverty. I mean, it is, it is you know, um, Mayor Barry several years ago did the Nashville Youth Violence Summit and they produced a report, Judge Calloway and David Williams and, and others took part in this. And they had six, you know, things that we should be doing and addressing. And, and educational opportunity is a big part of that. And access to transportation and getting children into uh, reducing adverse childhood experiences. And, and, and really capturing those children, like we talked about earlier, between the hours of 3 and 7 p.m. will make a tremendous difference. Not only will it improve the lives of the families in the community, but it'll have additional benefits, reducing, reducing youth violence, improving performance in our public schools, and, and, and all these other factors that will make this a truly great city. Well, we want to thank you so much for your time. I want to give the opportunity now to uh, tell our viewers directly why you want their vote and how they can learn more about you if they want to uh, get involved in your campaign or learn more about the issues. Yeah, well, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate the time today. So you can visit johnrayclemens.com uh, website and our social media are Clemens for Mayor. I'm running for mayor to address the biggest challenges facing Nashville families, not just for the few, but for the entire city. We're running our campaign by getting out in the community and listening and building a campaign platform around the issues and the challenges facing families. Our platform is about improving the quality of life of every family in Nashville, Tennessee. I would be excited to serve as your mayor. 
I'm not afraid to get in there, roll up my sleeves, do the hard work. I was raised on a farm. I learned what real hard work was all about. And, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm not afraid to stand up and fight for what I think is right. Not what's politically convenient, not always politically popular, but fight for what is right and make the tough decisions necessary for Nashville to continue to prosper and be a great city for everyone. So thank you again for having me. I appreciate thank it. Thank you, Representative Clemens. And to our viewers, we want to thank you so much for joining us. You can replay this video and watch other videos on Tennessean.com. Unfortunately, the registration deadline has passed, but hopefully you've registered and will go on July 12th to start early voting. Your last opportunity will be August 1st. Please vote. Your vote is your voice.